Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Now we're going to share something about this book, Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think, by Peter Diamandis and Stephen Cutler. I had read this like a few years ago, but I didn't finish it. I want to share with you now. The Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think. more complex cycle. and not from the authors a historical perspective these are turbulent times a quick glance at the headline is enough to set anybody on edge and with the endless media stream that has Lately become our lives. It's hard to get away from those headlines. Words, evolution shaped the human brain to be acutely aware of all potential dangers. I will be exploring later chapters. This dire combination has a profound impact on human perception. It literally shut off our ability to take in good news. This creates something of a challenge for us. As abundance is a tale of good news. At its core, this book examines the hard facts, the science and engineering, the social trends and economic forces that are rapidly transforming our world. But we are not so naive as to think that there is going to be bumps along the way. Some of those who will be pump, bumps, economic meltdowns, natural disasters, terrorist attacks. During these times, the concept of abundance will seem far off, alien, even nons nonsensical, But a quick look at history shows that progress continues through the good times and the bad. The 20th century, for example, witnesses both incredible advancement and unspeakable tragedy. The 1918 influenza epidemic killed 50 million people. World War II killed another 60 million. There were tsunamis, hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, floods, even plagues of locusts. Despite such unrest, this period also saw infant mor mortality decrease by 90%, maternal mortality decreased by 99%, and overall, human lifespan increased by more than 100%. In the past two decades, the United States has experienced tremendous economic upheaval. Yet today, even the poorest Americans have access to a telephone, televisions, and a flush toilet. Three luxuries that even the wealthiest couldn't imagine at the turn of the last century. In fact, as will soon be clear, using almost any metric currently available, quality of life has improved more in the past century than ever before. So while there are likely to be plenty of rude, heartbreaking interruptions along the way, As this book will demonstrate, global living standards will continue to improve regardless of the horrors that dominate the headlines. Why you should care? This is a book about improving global living standards and the standards that need the most help are these found in the developing world. This read a second question. For those of us living in the developing world, why should we care? After all, there are plenty of important issues facing us here at home. Both USA unemployment rates and foreclosure rates are soaring, so humanitarian reasons aside, should we really waste our time working toward an age of global abundance? The short answer is yes. Our days of isolation are behind us. In today's world, what happens over there impacts over here. Pandemic, do not respect borders, terrorist organizations operate on a global scale, and overpopulation is everybody's problem. What's the best way to solve these issues? Raise global standards of living. Research shows that the wealthier, more educated, and healthier a nation, the less violence and civil unrest among its populace. 
and the less likely that unrest will spread across its borders. As such, stable governments are better prepared to stop an infection disease outbreak before it becomes a global pandemic. And as a bonus, there is a direct correlation between quality of life and population growth rates as quality increases, world rates decrease. The point is this, in today's hyperlinked world, solving problems anywhere, solving problems everywhere. Moreover, the greatest tool we have for tackling our grand challenges is the human mind. The information and communication revolution now underway is rapidly spreading across the planet. Over the next eight years, three billion new individuals will be coming online, joining the global conversation and contributing to the global economy. Their ideas, ideas we never before had access to, will result in new discoveries, products and inventions that will benefit us all. A collaboration of two minds. Peter and Stephen first met in 2000, when Stephen wrote an article on the X Prize for GQ magazine. Peter enjoyed Stephen's writing style and approached him about a book collaboration on the concept of abundance. Peter had come to this organization principal through his creation of the X Prize Foundation and Singularity University and his work on innovation and exponential technologies. Stephen had been considering similar ideas and brought in his unique perspective and expertise on new neuroscience, psychology, technology, education, energy, and the environment to this book. This effort is a true partnership, as the ideas and the writing in abundance were shared equally between Peter and Stephen. Part 1. Perspective. Chapter 1. Our grandest challenge, the lesson of aluminium. Geos Plinius Cecilius Secundus, known as Pliny the Elder, was born in Italy in the year A.D. 23. He was a naval and army commander in the early Roman Empire, later an other naturalist and natural philosopher, best known for his naturalist historian a 37-volume encyclopedia describing well everything there was to describe. His opus includes a book on cosmology, another on farming, a third on magic. It took him four volumes to cover World Geographic, nine for flora and fauna, and another nine for medicine. In one of his later volumes, Earth Books 35, Pliny tells the story of a goldsmith who brought a, an unusual diner plate to the court of Emperor Tiberius. The plate was a stunner made from a new metal, very light, shiny, almost as bright as silver. The goldsmith claimed he extracted it from plain clay using a secret technique. The formula known only to himself and the gods, Tiberius thought, was a little concerned. The Emperor was one of Rome's great generals, a warmonger who conquered most of what's now Europe and amazed a fortune of gold and silver along the way. He was also a financial expert who knew the value of his treasure would seriously decline if people suddenly had access to a shiny new metal rather than gold. Therefore, recounts Pliny, instead of giving the goldsmith the regard expected, he ordered him to be beheaded. This shiny new metal was aluminium, and the beheading market its loss to the world for nearly two millennia. It next re reappeared during the early 1800s, but was still rare enough to be considered the most valuable metal in the world. Napoleon III himself threw a banquet for the king of Xi'an, where the honored guests were giving aluminium utensils, while the others had to make dough with gold. Aluminium's rarity comes down from chemistry, technically behind oxygen and silicon. It's the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust, making up 8.3% of the weight of the world. Today it's cheap, ubiquitous and used with a throwaway mindset, but as a Napoleon's banquet demonstrates, this wasn't always the case because of aluminium's high affinity of oxygen. It never appears in nature as a pure metal. Instead, it's found tightly bound as oxides 
and silicates in clay-like material called bauxite. While bauxite is 52% aluminium, separating out the pure metal or was a complex and difficult task. But between 1825 and 1845, Hans Christian Oersted and Frederick Wokler discovered that heating a hydrous aluminium chloride with potassium amalgam and then distilling away the mercury left a residue of pure aluminium. In 1854, Henry St. Clair developed Clair the first commercial process for extraction, driving down the price by 90%, yet the metal was still costly and its short supply. It was the creation of a new breakthrough technology known as electrolysis, discovered independently and almost simultaneously in 1886 by American chemist Charles Martin Hall and Frenchman Paul Herold that changed everything. The whole Herold process, as it's now known, used electricity to liberate aluminum from bauxite. Suddenly, everyone on the planet had access to ridiculous amounts of cheap, light, pliable metal. Save the vehicling, there is nothing too unusual to the story. History is littered with tales of one's rare resource made plentiful by innovation. The reason is pretty straightforward. Scarcity is often contextual. Imagine a giant orange tree packed with fruit. If I pluck all the orange from the low branches, I am effectively out of accessible food. From my limited perspective, orange are now scarce. But once someone invents a piece of technology called a ladder, I be suddenly got new rich. Problem solved. Technology that throws liberating mechanism. It can make the ones scared and now abundant. To expand on this a bit, let's take a look at the planet city of Masdar, now under construction by the Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, located on the edge of Abu Dhabi, out past the oil refinery and the airport. Masdar will soon house 50,000 residents, while another 40,000 work there. They will do so without producing any waste or releasing any carbon. No cars will be allowed within the city's perimeter and no fossils will be consumed inside the walls. Abu Dhabi is the fourth largest OPEC producer with 10% of no oil reserves. Fortune magazine once called it the wealthiest city in the world. All which makes it interesting that they are willing to spend 20 billion of that wealth building the the world's first post-petroleum city. In February 2009, I traveled to Abu Dhabi to find and just how interesting soon after arriving, I left my hotel, hopped in a cab, and took a ride out to the master construction site. It was a journey back in time. I was staying at the Emirates Palace, which is both one of the most expensive hotels ever built one of the few places I know where someone, someone that is with a budget, budget much different from mine, can rent a gold plate suit for 11,500 a night, until the discovery of oil in 1960. Abu Dhabi had been a community of nomadic herders and peril divers. As my taxi drove past the welcome to the future home of Masdar sign, I saw an evidence of this. I was hoping the world's first post-petroleum city might look something like a Star Trek set. What I found was a few construction trailers parked in the parking plot of desert. During my visit, I had a chance to meet Jay Wetspoon, the technical director for the whole project. Wetspoon explained the challenges they were facing and the reasons for those challenges. Masdar, he said, was being built on a conceptual foundation known as a one planet living. OPL. To understand OPL, Wetspoon explained, I first had to understand three facts. Fact 1. Currently, humanity uses 30% more of our planet's natural resources than we can replace. Fact 2. If everyone on this planet wanted to live with the lifestyle of the average European, we would need three planets worth of resources to put it off. Fact 3. If everyone on this planet wished to live like an average North American, then we didn't need five planets to put it off. OPL. 
then is a global initiative meant to combat this shortage. The OPL initiative, created by Bioregional Development and the World Wildlife Fund, is really a set of ten core principles. The stretch from preserving indigenous cultures to development of cradle to cradle sustain sustainable materials, but really they're really about learning to share. Mas that is one of the most expensive construction projects in history. The entire city is being built for a post-petroleum future where oil shortages and water, water, water are a significant threat. But this is where the lesson of aluminium becomes relevant. Even in a world without oil, Mazar is still bathed in sunlight. A lot, of, a lot of sunlight, the amount of solar energy that hits our atmosphere has been well established at 174 petawatts, 1074 by 10, by 17 watts, plus or minus 3.5%. Out of this total solar flux, approximately half reached the Earth's surface. Since humanity currently consumes about 16 terawatts annually, going by 2008 numbers, there is over 5,000 times more solar energy falling on the planet's surface than we use in a year. Once again, it's not an issue of scarcity, it's an issue of accessibility. Moreover, as far as water wars are concerned, Mazar sit on the Persian Gulf, which is a mighty aqueous body. The Earth itself is a water planet covered 70% by oceans. But these oceans, like the Persian Gulf, are far too salty for consumption or crop production. In fact, 97.3% of all water on this planet is salt water. What if, though, in the same way that electro electrolysis easily transforms bauxite into aluminium, a new technology could desaline, desalinate just a minute fraction of our oceans. How thirsty is mass, mass darden? The point is this. When see through the lens of technology, few resources are truly scarce. They are mainly inaccessible. Yet the trade of scarcity still dominates our worldview. The limits to grow. Scarcity has been an issue since life first emerged on his planet. But it is contemporary incarnation, what many call the scarcity model, dates of the late 18th century, when British scholar Thomas Robert Malthus realized that while food production expands linearly, population grows exponentially because of this. Malthus was certain there was going to come a point in time when we would exceed it our capacity to feed ourselves. As he put it, the power of population is definitely greater than the power of the earth to produce subsistence for men. In the years since, plenty of thinkers have echoed this concern. By the early 1960s, something of a consensus had been reached. In 1966, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. pointed out Unlike the plagues of the dark ages of the contemporary diseases, which we do not understand, the modern plague of our population is soluble by means we have discovered and with resources we possess. Two years later, Stanford University biologist Dr. Paul R. Englich sounded an even louder alarm with the publication of the population bomb. But it was a downstream result of a small meeting held in 1968 that really altered the world to the depth of the crisis. That year, Scottish scientist Alexander King and Italian industrialist Aurelio Pesce gathered together a multidisciplinary group of top international thinkers at a small villa in Rome. The Club of Rome, as this group was so known, had come together to discuss the problems of short-term thinking in a long-term world. In 1972, they published the results of that discussion. The limits to growth become an instant classic, selling 12 million copies in 30 languages and scaring almost everyone who read it, using a model developed by the founder of System Dynamics. Jay Forrester, the club compared worldwide population growth rates to global resource consumption rates the science behind this model is complicated. The message was not quite simple. 
we are running out of resources and we are running out of time. It's been over four decades since that report came out, while many of their more dire predictions have failed to materialize. For the most part, the years have been offen- softened the assessment. Today we are still finding proof of its veracity in most places we look. One in four mammals now faces extinction, while 90% of the large fish are already gone. Our fires are starting to dry up. Our soil growing too salty for crop production. We are running out of oil, running low on uranium. Even phosphorus, one of the principal ingredients in fertilizer, is in short supply. In the time it takes to read this sentence, one child will die for hunger. By the time you be made it through this paragraph, another will be dead from thirst or from drinking dirty water to quench the thirst. And this, this experts say, is just to warm up around. There are now more than 7 billion people on the planet. If trends don't reverse by 2050, we will be closer to 10 billion. Scientists who study the current capacity of the Earth, the measure of how many people can live here sustainable, have fluctuated massively in their state measures. While I optimists believe it's close to 2 billion. Door pessimists think it may be 300 million, but if you agree with even the most uplifting of these predictions, as Dr. Nina Fedorov, science and technology advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State, recently told reporters only one conclusion can be drawn. We need to decrease the growth rate of the global population. The planet cannot support many more people. Some things, though, are easier said than done. The most infamous example of top-down population control was the Nazis' eugenics program, but there have been a few other nightmares as well. India performed more two legations and vasectomies in thousands of people during the middle 1970s. Some were paid for this sacrifice, others were simply forced into a procedure. The result drove the ruling party out of power, created a controversy that is still rages today. China, meanwhile, has spent 30 years under one child per family policy. While it is often discussed as a blanket program, this policy actually extends to only about 36% of the population. According to the government, the results have been 300 million fewer people. According to Amnesty International, the results have been an increase in the briefly corruption, suicide, rates, abortion rates, forced sterilization procedures, and persistent rumors of infanticide. A male child is preferable, so rumors hold that newborn girls are being murdered. Either way, as our species has sadly discovered, top-down population control is barbaric, both in the theory and the practice. This seems to leave only one remaining option. If you can't shield people, you have to stretch resources those people use and stretch them dramatically. How to do this has been a matter of much debate, but these days the principles of OPL have been put forward as the only viable options. These options bothered me, but not because I wasn't committed to the idea of greater efficiency. Seriously, use less, gain more. Who would be opposed to efficiency? Rather, the source of my concern was that efficiency was being forwarded as the only option available. But everything, everything I was doing with my life told me there were additional paths more pursuing. The organization I ran, the X Prize Foundation, is a nonprofit dedicated to bringing about radical breakthrough for the benefit of humanity through the design and operation of large incentive prize competitions. One month before traveling to Mazdar, I chaired to our annual visionary board meeting, where maverick inventors like Dean Kamen and Craig Venter, brilliant technology entrepreneurs such as Larry Page and Elon Musk, and international business giants like Ratan Tada and Anousius and Zari were debating how to drive radical breakthrough in energy, labs, life science, education, and global development. These are all people who have created world-changing industry where none had existed before. 
Most of them accomplished this feat by solving problems that had long been considered unsolvable. Taken together, they are a group whose track record show that one of the better responses to the threat of scarcity is not to try to slice our pie thinner, rather it's to figure out how to make more pies. The possibility of abundance, of course. The make more pies approach is nothing new, but there are a few key differences this time around. This difference will comprise the full of this book, but the short version is that for the first time in history, our capabilities have been begun to catch up our ambitions. Humanity is now entering a period of radical transformation in which technology has the potential to significantly raise the basic standards of living for every man, woman, and child, child on the planet. Within a generation, we will be able to provide goods and services, once reserved for the wealthy few to any and all who need them or desire them. Abundance for all is actually within our grasp. In this modern age of cynicism, many of us rile in the fact of such proclamation, but elements for this transformation are already underway. Over the past 20 years, wireless technology and internet have become ubiquitous, affordable and available to almost everyone. Africa has skipped a technological generation by passing the landline that described our western skies for the wireless way. Mobile phone penetration is growing exponentially from 2% in 2000 to 28% in 2009 to an expected 70% in 2013. Already folks with no education, a little to eat, have gained access to cellular non connectivity on here of just 30 years ago. Right now, a Maasai warrior with a cell phone has better mobile phone capabilities than the President of the United States did 25 years ago. And if he is on a smartphone with access to Google, then he has better access to information than the President did just 15 years ago. By the end of 2013, the vast majority of humanity will be caught in this same worldwide web of instantaneous, low-cost communications and information. In other words, we are now living in a world of information and communication abundance. In a similar fashion, the advancement of new transformational technology computational systems, networks and sensor, artificial intelligence, robotics, biotechnology, bioinformations, 3D printing, nanotechnology, human-machine interfaces, and biomedical engineering will soon enable the vast majority of humanity to experience what only the affluent have access of today. Even better, these technologies aren't the only change agents in play. There are three additional forces at work, each augmented the power of exponentially gross technologies, each with significant abundance producing potential, a do-it-yourself. Revolution has been brewing for the past 50 years, but lately it's begun to bubble over. In today's world, the purview of backyard tinkers has extended far beyond customer cares and homebrew computers, and now reaching to one's esoteric fields like genetics and robotics. What's more, these days, small groups of motivated dyers can accomplish what was once the sole province of large corporations and governments. The aerospace giants felt it was impossible, but Borutan flew into space. Craig Venter tied a mighty US government in the race to the sequence of the human genome. The newfound power of these maverick innovators is the first of our three forces. The second force is money, a lot of money being spent in a very particular way. The light touch revolution created an entirely new breed of well techno techno philanthropists who are using their fortunes to solve global abundance related challenges. Bill Gates is crusading against malaria. Mark Zuckerberg is working to reinvent education. While Pierre and Pam Omidyar are focused on bringing the electricity to the developing world. And these lights go on and on. Taken together, our second driver is a techno philanthropic force on revival and history. Lastly, they are the very poorest of the poor, the so called bottom billion, who are finally plunging into the global economy and are poised to become what I call the rising billion. 
The creation of a global transportation network was the initial step down in this path, but it is the combination of the internet microfinance and wireless communication technology that transforming the poorest to the poor into emerging market force. Acting along each of these three forces had an enormous potential, but acting together amplified by exponentially growing technologies. The once unimaginable becomes now actually possible. So what's possible? Imagine a world of 9 billion people with clean water, nutrition, food, affordable housing, personalized education, top tier medical care, and non-polluting, ubiquitous energy. Building this better world is humanity's grandest challenge. What follows is the story of how we can rise to meet it. Chapter 2 Building the Pyramid the travel with definitions. Abundance is radical vision and before we can start striving for it, we must first start by defining it. In trying to map this territory, some economists take a bottom-up approach and begin with poverty. But this can be tricky. The U.S. government defines poverty using two different metrics, absolute poverty and relative poverty. Absolute poverty measures the numbers of people living under a certain income threshold. Relative poverty is a keeping up with the Jones measure, comparing individuals' income with the average income for entire economy. But the difficulty with both terms is that abundance is a global vision and neither hold up well when it spread beyond borders. For example, in 2008, the World Bank revised its international poverty line and absolute poverty metric from the long-standing those living in less than one dollar a day to those living on less than 1.25 a day. By that figure, someone who works six days a week for 52 weeks earns 390 for their year. But that same year, the U.S. government claimed the 39.1 million individuals found in the 48 contiguous states. Alaska and Hawaii has slightly different numbers who earn 10,400 also live in absolute poverty. Clearly, there is a pretty big path between these totals. How to re rectify that disparity, as would have to be done if you interested was setting a uniform target for the global reduction of poverty, is a problem for the absolute poverty measure. A problem with the relative poverty measure is that it doesn't matter how much you earn in relation to your neighbors if that money can't buy what you need. The ease of availability of goods and services is another critical factor in determining quality of life. But that ab availability varies tremendously according to the one's geographic. Today, most poverty stricken Americans have a television, telephone, electricity, running water, and in their plumbing. Most Africans do not. If you transfer the goods and services enjoyed by those who live in California's version of poverty to, the, to those average Somalian living on less than 1.25 a day, that Somalian is suddenly fabulously rich, and this makes us any relative poverty measure less than useful for setting global standards. Furthermore, both of these terms grow even shaker when we play it out over time. Today, Americans living below the poverty line are not just light years ahead of most Africans. They're light years ahead of the wealthiest Americans from just a century ago. Today, 99% of Americans living below the poverty line have electricity, water, flushing toilets, and refrigerators. 95% have a television, 88% have telephone, 71% have a car, and 70% even have air conditioning. This may not seem like much, but 100 years ago, men like Henry Ford and Cornelius Vanderbilt were among the richest on the planet, but they enjoy a few of these luxuries. A practical definition. Perhaps a better way to edge toward definition of abundance is to start with what I am not talking about. I am not talking about Trump Towers, Mercedes Benz, and Gucci. Abundance is not about providing everyone on this planet with a life of luxury. Rather, it's about providing all with a life of possibility. To be able to live such a life requires having the bases covered and then some. It also means 
stenching some fairly ridiculous bleeding, feeding the hungry, providing access to clean water, ending indoor air pollution, and wiping out malaria, four entirely preventable conditions that kill respectively seven, three, three, and two people per minute worldwide is a must. But ultimately, abundance is about creating a world of possibility, a world where everyone's day are spent dreaming and doing, not scrapping and scrapping. Certainly, the above ideas are still too fussy, but the area doesn't place to start in trying to solidify this target. I look at levels of need loosely related to American psychologist Abraham Maslow's now famous pyramid. From 1937 to 1951, Maslow was an up-and-comer staff of Brooklyn College being mentored by anthropologist Ruth Benedict and Jesla psychologist Max Wertheimer. Back then, most of psychology was focused on fixing pathological problems rather than celebrating psychological possibilities, but Maslow had other ideas. He taught both Benedict and, and Wertheimer such a wonderful human beings that he began studying their behavior, trying to figure out what it was they were doing right. Over time, he began studying the behavior of other ex examples of ultimate human performance. Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Frederick Douglass each came under this scrutiny. Maslow was looking for common traits and common circumstances, wanted to explain why these folks could attain such unbelievable hate, while so many others continued to flounder. To illustrate his thinking, Maslow created his hierarchy of human needs, a theory arranged like a pyramid. In this pyramid, there are five levels of human needs, with the top tier of the pyramid belonging to self-actualization or a human being's need to reach their full potential. According to Maslow, the needs at each level have to be satisfied before a person can progress to the next. For this reason, physical needs like air, water, food, warmth, sex, and sleep are the pyramid's base, followed closely by safety needs like protection, security, law, order and stability. His middle tire is occupied by love and belonging, belongingness, family relationship, affection and work, and above that is esteem, achievement, status, responsibility and reputation. At the very top are his self-actualizing needs, which are about personal growth and fulfillment through they really constitute one's devotion to a higher purpose and a willingness to serve society. My pyramid of abundance, while a little more comprehends, compressed, does Maslow's follow a similar scheme for similar reasons. There are three levels, with the bottom belonging to food, water, shelter, and other basic survival concerns. The middle is devoted to catalysts for further growth like abundant energy, ample educational opportunities, and access to ubiquitous communication and information, while the higher tie is reserved for freedom and health. Two core prerequisites enable an individual to contribute to society. Let's take a closer look. The base of pyramid. At the base of pyramid, creating global abundance means taking care of simple psychological needs, providing sufficient water, food, and shelter, having three to five liters of clean drinking water per person per day, and 2,000 calories or more of balance and nutrition food gives everyone on the planet the necessary water and food requirements of optimal health. Making sure that everyone receives a full complement of vitamins and minerals, either through one's food or in the form of supplement, is also critical. For example, simply by providing a population with the requisite amount of vitamin A removes the leading cause of preventable blindness of children from the global health equation. On top of these things, an additional 25 liters of water is necessary for bathing, cooking and cleaning. And considering that 837 million people now live in slums and the United Nations predicts that this number will rise to 2 billion by 2050, a durable shelter that protects against the elements and further provides adequate reading light, ventilation and sanitation is also a must. Of course, in the developer world, this may not sound like much, but it's a game changer most everywhere else, and not just for the obvious reasons. The obvious reasons begin with Thomas Friedman's flat war, 
on this small planet. Our grand challenges are not isolated concerns, rather they are staked up like rows of dominions. If we topple one domino, by meeting one challenge, plenty of others will follow suit. The results are a feedback loop of positive gain. Even better, the reverberations of this cascade stretch far beyond borders, which means that providing for basic psychological needs in developing countries also improves quality of life in the developing ones as well. This is such an important point that before we return to the abundance pyramid, it's worth dividing. Dividing the deeper into the upside of one of these goals, providing everyone on the planet with clean water. The upside of water. Currently, a billion people lack access to safe drinking water. And 2.6 billion lack access to the basic sanitation. As a result, half of the world hospitalizations are due to people drinking water contaminated with infection agents, toxic chemicals, and radiological hazards. According to the World Health Organization, just one of those infection agents, the bacteria that cause diarrhea, accounts for 5.1% one percent of the global disease burden killing 1.8 million children a year right now more folks have access to a cell phone than a toilet in fact the ancient romans had better water quality than half the people alive today so what happens if we solve this one problem according to calculation done by peter glake at the pacific institute an estimated 135 million people will die before 2020 because they lack safe drinking water and proper sanitation. First and foremost, access to clean water means saving these lives. But it also means sub-Saharan Africa no longer loses the 5% of its gross domestic product. That's currently wasted on the health spending, productivity, loses and labor diversions all associated with dirty water. Furthermore, because the hydration also lowers one's ability to absorb nutrients. Providing clean water helps those suffering from hunger and malnutrition. As a bonus, an entire litany of diseases and disease vectors gets wiped off the planet. As do a number of environment concerns, fewer trees will be chopped down to boil water. Fewer fossil fuels will be burned to purify water. And this is merely the beginning. One of the advantages we now possess in addressing the world's woes is information. We have a lot of it, especially about population growth and its various drivers and effects. For example, couple what we know about the planet's carrying capacity with what we know about population growth rates and no surprise that so many feel we are heading for disaster. So direct so there does this treat appear that one of the frequent criticisms leveled at the concept of abundance is that by solving problems like dirty water, the result, however, high-minded in intent, will only serve to boost global population and worsen our situation. On a certain level, this is absolutely correct. If the 884 million currently facing water shortage suddenly get enough to drink, this will certainly keep a great many of them alive for a good while longer. A population spike will result, but there are some evolutionary reasons why it won't last. Homo sapiens has been on the planet for roughly 150,000 years, yet until 1900. There was only one country in the world with an infant mortality rate below 10%. Since, you, since children take care of their parents later in life, in places where a lot of children die by having a large family, parents are ensuring themselves a more comfortable old age. The good news is the inverse is also true. As Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates pointed out in his recent talk on the subject, the key thing you can do to reduce population growth is actually improve health. There is a perfect correlation as you improve health. Within half a generation, the population growth rate goes down. And the reason Gates knows this is because he is seeing a plethora of population data that has been gathered over the last 40 years. Morocco, for example, is now a young nation. Over half the population is under the age of 25. Almost one third is under the 15. 
Having these many kinds around is a fairly recent historical development, but not for a lack of trying. Back in 1971, when child mortality rates were high and average life expectancy rates were low, Moroccan women had an average of 7.8 children. But after making great strides in improving water, sanitation, health care, and women's rights, these days Morocco's baby boom is winding down. The average number of births per woman is now 2.7 while the population growth rate has dipped below 1.6%, and all because people are living longer, healthier, free lives. John Oldfield, Managing Director of the WASH Advocacy Initiative, which is dedicated to solving global water challenges, explained in this way, the best way to control population is through increasing child survival, educating girls, and making knowledge about another availability of air control ubiquitous. By far the most important of this is increasing child survival. In communities where childhood death rates over near one third most parents up to significantly overshoot their desired family size. They will have replacement births, insurance births, lottery births and the population source. It's counterintuitive but eradicating small packs and vaccine, vaccine preventable disease and stopping the rare disease and malaria are the best family planning programs yet devised. More disease, especially affecting the poor, will raise infant and child mortality which in turn will rise the birth rate. With fewer childhood deaths, you get lower fertility rates. It's really that straightforward. By solving our water worries, we're also alleviating world hunger. Relieving poverty, lowering the global disease burden, slowing rampant population growth, and preserving the biosphere. Children will no longer be yanked out of school to gather water and the firewood needed to boil water. So education levels will begin to rise. Since women also waste hours a day running these same runs, Providing clean water also betters everything from quali quality of family life to quantity of family income because mom now has time to get a job. But the best news is that water is merely one example of this interdependent phenomenon. The solution to all of our grand challenges are similarly staked and toppling any of these dominoes set off a positive chain reaction which is yet another reason why abundance for all is closer than many suspect. The pursuit of catalaxy. Once our base survival needs are fulfilled, the next level up the abundance pyramid is energy, education, and information communication. Why this particular tree of advantages? Because these three pay double dividends. In the short term, they raise the standards of living. In the long run, they paved the way for two of the greatest abundance assets in history, specialization and exchange. Energy provides the means to do work. Education allows workers to specialize. Information, communication, abundance, not only further specialization through expanding educational opportunities, it allows specialists to exchange specialties, thus creating what economist Frederick Hayek called catalaxy the ever-expanding possibility generated by the division of labor. In this excellent book, The Rational Optimist, How Prosperity Evolves, Matt Ridley elaborates, If I sue you a high tunic today, you can sue me in tomorrow's brings limited rewards and diminishing returns. But I make the clothes, you catch the food brings increasing returns. And that it has the beautiful property that it does not even need to be fair. For bad to work, two individuals do not need to offer things of equal value. Trade is often unequal, but it is still benefits both sides. Out of this trilogy, energy is clearly the biggest game changer. So how much energy does it take to change the game? Let's start in Nigeria, in Africa's most populous country. The average household has five people living in a single room. Under these conditions, four lights should provide ample illumination. 
typically a, a 60 word incandescent bulb is enough to read by and that's the figure well used of our calculation but today that's a semi-luminosity can be provided for 15 watt fluorescent and in the future with even less energy by using even more efficient LED lighting em emitting diode technology. Let's add to the list of efficient 16 cubic form refrigerator that runs on 150 watts and uh, keeps critical food and the drugs from perishing. A two burning cook stove at 1200 watts. Two electric fans for ventilation at 100 watts each. A couple of laptop computers at 45 watts each. And Swedish exploring a LCD TV, DVD player, and radio for 100 watts. Although laptops will eventually displace these needs. Include another 24 watts for charging five cell phones. And we get a total of 1.73 kilowatts peak load. If we assume average use for these items, we end up with a charging minimum of 8.7 kilowatts hour per household per day. Well, that's about a quarter of the power consuming an average U.S. household. An average household of 2.6 people consumes 16.4 kilowatts per day or 6.32 kilowatts per person per day, excluding the gas and oil used for heating. It's a radical improvement for Nigeria. It's also a radical improvement in a lot of other places as well. For example, the two-burner electric cook stove is a simple device, but it would bring a magnificent change to the 3.5 billion people who now cook food and get light and heat by burning biomass, wood, dung, and crap residue. According to a 2002 WHO report, 36% of acute upper respiratory infections, 22% of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and 1.5% of all cancers are all caused by indoor air pollution resulting from this practice. Thus, an electric cook stove relieves 4% of the global disease burden. Even better than just like water, the electric cook stove is another example of interconnected solutions. A 2007 UN report found that 90% of all wood removal in Africa are used for energy. Thus, providing the power to run a cook stove will also help preserve endangered forests and the entire litany of ecosystem services those forests provide. Ecosystem services are things like crop pollinations, carbon sequestration, climate regulation, water purification, air purification, nutrient dispersal, nutrient recycling, waste processing, flood control, pest control, disease control, and so forth that the environment provides for us free of charge. This is a big deal for two reasons. The first is that the value of the ecosystem service our environment now provides for free has been calculated at 36 trillion a year, a figure roughly equal to the entire annual global economy. The second reason is that as the 200 million experiment that was biosphere, so to clear prove none of these are services we can yet provide for ourselves. But the cook stove's advantage are not only ecological. Freed from the burden of full gathering, women and children can get jobs and education and since all of these factors far lower child mortality and enhance women's rights. And concurrent reduction in population growth will occur. What's more, if a cook stove alone can bring this much positive change, consider the upside of the proposed 8.7 kilowatt hours of power running a much fluid complement of appliances. Reading, writing, and ready. Another profound change would be education, specifically teaching every child on the planet the basics of literacy, mathematics, life skills, and critical thinking. Here, too, this may seem too thin and offering, but most experts feel this proposed quarter of grade school base is the foundation of self-improvement which is obviously abundance backbone. Moreover, self-improvement doesn't mean what is used to. Since the advent of the Internet, these basics are the background needed to understand a significant portion of online materials, thus providing the fundamental necessary to access what's clear the greatest self-improvement tool in history. This emphasis on personal growth and personal responsibility is key because we are in the minds of educational revolution. 
a expert like Sid King Robinson, who was kinded for this contribution to education, have said repeatedly, these days, antiquated classrooms are the least of our worries. Suddenly, degrees aren't worth anything, says Robinson. When I was a student, if you had a degree, you had a job. If you didn't have a job, it was because you didn't want one. The problem is both that there are many places in the world without any education infrastructure and in those places where it does exist, they rely on a pedagogical framework that is seriously outdated. Most of today's educational systems are built upon the same learning hierarchy, math and science at the top, humanities in the middle, art on the bottom. The reason for this is because these systems were developed in the 19th century in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, when this hierarchy provides the best foundation for success. This is no longer the case. In a rapidly changing technology, culture and ever-growing information-based economy, creative ideas are the ultimate resource. Yet our current educational system does little to nourish this resource. Moreover, our current system is built around fact-based learning, but the Internet makes almost every fact desirable instantly available. This means we are training our children in skills they really need, while ignoring those they are absolutely do, teaching kids how to nourish their creativity and curiosity while still providing a sound foundation in critical thinking. Literacy and math is the best way to prepare them for a future of increasingly rapid technological change. Even better is the technological change that's coming. Unlike the one-size-fits-all framework that's our current educational system because tomorrow's version is arriving via personal computers or personal computing devices like a smartphone, it's decentralized, personalized, and extremely interactive. Decentralized means learning cannot easily be, be curtailed by autocratic governments and is considered more immune to socio-economic upheaval. Personalizing means that it can be tailored to individual needs and a preferable learning style. These are both significant improvements, but many feel that it is interactivity that could bring the biggest gains. As Nicolas Negroponte, founder of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Media Lab and the organization One Laptop per Child, whose goal is to put a laptop in the hands of every school child in the world explains, Epistemologists from John Dewey to Paulo Freire to Seymour Paper agree that you learn through doing. This suggests that if you want more learning, you want more doing. The ZOLPC puts an emphasis in software tools for exploring expression rather than instruction. Lobbies are better master than duty. Using the laptop as the agents of engaging children in constructing knowledge evasion about their personal interest and providing them tools for sharing the critiquing. This construction will lead them to become learners and teachers. Turning on the data tab. The final item at this level of our pyramid is information and communication abundance. The topic has already been touched upon. But the impact of these improvements cannot be overstated. In Kenya, a Jeff Flyman service known as a Kazi 560 used mobile phones to connect potential workers with potential employers. In its first seven years, some 60,000 Kenyans have found employment via the network. In Zambia, farmers without bank accounts now rely on mobile phones to buy seeds and fertilizer, boasting their profits was almost 20%. In Niger, in 2005, cell phones served as the fact national food distribution system and effectively water of a famine in 2007. Business executive Isis Nayon, them with MTV now with Google, told the BBC that the impact of the mobile phone in Africa has had about the same effect as democratic change of leadership. Perhaps most important, cell phones produced this change nearly organically. The technology did not have to be sold in any traditional sense. Instead, cell phones spread virally and nearly unstoppable. To borrow Malcolm Gladwell's phrase, the idea tip, once people understood the technology and once the technology became vaguely affordable, vaguely that is because cell phones in the third world are often microfinanced, 
the rate of growth become exponential. Just look at Nigeria. In 2001, 134 million Nigerians were sharing 500,000 landlines. That same year, the government began encouraging market competition in wireless communication and the market responded by 2007. Nigeria has 30 million cellular subscribers. This obviously produced a big boost in the local economy. But it's important to remember that it wasn't just Nigerians who benefited. When Nokia's profit hit 1 billion in 2009, the company said that market penetration in Africa was largely responsible. In 2010, when the Finnish multinational sold its billion handset, it came as no surprise that the sale took place in Nigeria. The peak of the pyramid. Abundance in all inclusive idea. It means everyone. It means the individual most matter. And matter like never before. In light of this, my abundance pyramid culminates with a pair of concepts that the strange thing. The individual ability to matter. Health and freedom will start with health. In the individual matters, then the individual well-being matters. Thus preserving good health and providing good health care are are components of abundant world. And one thing is most certain, this creation of this world starts by stopping the needles death of millions resulting from the ailments either entirely preventable or already easy to treat. Acute respiratory infections are one of the leading causes of serious illness worldwide, accounting for about 2 million deaths each year and ranking first among causes of disability, adjusted life years lost in development countries. The population most at risk are the young, the other elderly, and the immunocompromised. Why is this the case? Because this infection typically go undiagnosed. Pneumonia and disease we've been able to treat for almost centuries still accounts for 19% of all deaths in children under 5. More per perplexing, the drugs to treat pneumonia are generic, dirty, cheap, and ubiquitous. This means that the problem is mostly one of diagnosis and or distribution. These days, to perform a blood test, you need access to sterilized equipment and trained personnel. Clearly, it doesn't take much to take a blood sample, but after being gathered, it has to be sent to appropriate labs and then everyone must wait days, sometimes weeks, for the results. Not only are the tests prohibited, prohibitively expensive, but in the developing world where public transportation can be no existence, it's hard enough for most people just to get to the doctor in the first place, let alone to return weeks later to learn the results and obtain treatments. A technology now under development known as the lab on a chip has the potential to solve these problems. Packaging a portable cell phone size device. LOC will allow doctors, nurses, and even patients themselves to take a simple bodily fluid such as urine, sputum, or a single drop of blood, and draw dozens, if not hundreds, of diagnostics on the spot and in a matter of minutes. It's a game-changing technology, says John T. McDevitt, a Rice University professor of bioengineering and chemi chemistry and the early pioneer in the field. In the developing world, it will bring reliable health care to billions who don't currently have it. In the developing world, like here in the US, where medical costs go up another 8% every year and 16.5% of the economy goes to health care, if personalized medical technologies like the lab on a chip aren't brought to bear on the situation, we are going to bankrupt the country. Another upside to LOC technology is the ability to gather data. Because these chips are online, the information they collect, like say an outbreak of a swine flu, can be immediately uploaded to a cloud, where it can be analyzed for deeper patterns. For the first time, says McDevitt, we will have access to larger quantities of global medical data. This will be crucial and in halting the spread of a new emerging disease and pandemics. Moreover, LOC are but one such technology current development according to 2010 report by Prince PricewaterhouseCoopers, the field of personalized medicine and industry that really didn't exist before 2001 as the sequence of the human genome is often cited at this start date, is growing at rate of 15% a year. 
By 2015, the global market for personalized medicine is projected to reach 452 billion. All of which is to say, we will soon have the means, methods, and motivational to value individual well-being like never before. Freedom. The final element in our pyramid of abundance is freedom. This may seem a tall order, but it's a critical one. In this 1999 book, Development as a Freedom, the Nobel Prize winning economic Amartya Sen pointed out that political liberty moves in lockstep with sustainable development. Since abundance by definition is a sustainable goal, then a certain level of freedom is the prerequisite for reaching that goal. Luckily, a certain level of freedom also emerged organically in response to certain new technologies, especially those of the communication and information variety. This idea is not new. In his 1962 book, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, an inquiry into a category of origin society, social philosopher George Habermans argues that empowering people with tools for open expression puts increasing pressure on undemocratic leaders while concurrently expanding the rights of the public. But even a thinker, as a writer, Habermas could not have predicted what J.R. Cohen discovered in June, June 2009. Cohen is a young Jean White internet savvy, Harvard graduate who joined President Barack Obama's State Department for a chance to work under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. It was Cohen who, in the midst of the June 2009 post-election protests in Iran, reached out to Twitter founder Jack Dorsey and urged the company to reschedule its planned website maintenance so that Iranians could keep tweeting, given that all the forms of the communication had been blocked or shut down. Twitter became the Iranian pipeline to the outside world. The importance of this pipeline has been the subject of much debate the Weeby Awards, the leading international awards honoring online excellence, put the so-called Twitter revolution on its list of top 10 inter moments of the decade alongside the 2008 presidential campaign and the Google IPO, while others have pointed out that tweets don't stop bullets, but either way. The revolution certainly proved that information technology are extremely potent charge agents, change agents, by using new media to extend horizontal linkage and press the current regime. Road political analyst Patrick Kirk in Foreign Policy Focus this generation has reinforced the foundation of a potentially robust force for democratic change. Now is this change Merlin Iran and phenomenon. A 2009 report by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency examined the impact of information and communication technologies, ICT, for advancing democracy and empowerment in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda and found access to all the strategic use the of ICTs have been shown to have the potential to help bring about economic development, poverty reduction and democratization, including freedom of speech, the free flow from information and the promotion of human rights. The bigger challenge. So there you have it, a first look at our hard targets. As far as time frame from reaching these targets, everything outlined in the preceding pages and much more to be discussed later should be achievable within 25 years. With notice about change possible within the next decade, of course, now that we've defined our targets and our timetable, there is a, another problem to so resolve. The fact that all this seems a little too far-fetched. And in most of what ails us by 2035, can he really be serious? And therein lies in focus on the next few chapters, while part 2 and 3 and 5 of this book are devoted to the technologies involved in these changes. Part 4 examines the three forces that are coming together to make such abundance possible, and 6 examines ways to accelerate and direct this process. The remainder of part 1 is devoted to exploring why many of us, when hearing the promise of abundance, simply cannot believe in the possibility. People crying fall for a number of reasons. There are some who believe that the whole of disease, hunger, and war we recording appear too deep to climb out of, forget about anything else. For others, 
The time frame is too short and not enough technological progress will be made in the next few decades of them to these concerns. Then there are those who see our problems worsening, the rich getting richer and the poor falling farther behind. While the list of the global threats, pandemics, terrorism, escalating regional conflicts grows unbated. These are all valid concerns and we will address each of them in chapters to come. But first it's helpful to understand a little more about the roots of this cynicism and why it's this reaction, the inability of people to see the positive trends through the sea of bad news that many of the biggest stumbling block of the road toward abundance. That's it for now. I will share more in the future. Have a good night, good day, and good afternoon. God bless. Bye-bye.